Well, good morning. It's a nice snowy morning to come in. It's good to get that kind of workout uh, before we get started in the morning before you come into church. So welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Um, Last year, I was coming down into Milwaukee. I live north of the city, and um, I had never in my life hit anybody with my car, nor had I been hit by anybody with my car. I actually have a friend who seems to get into an accident about once a year. Uh, How many of you get into accidents way more often than you'd like to admit? Okay, we had one guy in first service who was like, yep, right here. Uh, that, I'm the opposite. I'm like, for whatever reason, I've just been able to avoid accidents. Uh, but I was coming in. That all changed last year. I was coming in one morning. It was a morning very similar to this morning. I was driving in the right lane on I-43. And this guy in this kind of tricked out car was coming up in the left lane at a really fast speed. And I say tricked out because I'm not a big car person, but he had like these lights that go all the way around the edge of the car. Somebody in this room knows what's going on with that, but he has that going on, and then he had, like, his wheels were, like, really fancy and, like, kind of, like, twirling in a weird way. There were, like, lights and kind of crazy stuff happening with his car, and I thought, wow, that's a really cool car, except that it was a minivan. So it was sort of... It was sort of like a, like a moving oxymoron going down the freeway because on the one hand, it's was like, well, oh, that's really cool. And on the other hand, it was like, no, it's not really cool. It's a minivan. But he was in a, in a big hurry. And I was driving in the right lane. He was in the left lane. And there was a middle lane. And he was kind of stuck there. And so he was going to try to uh, get past a car that was in the middle lane. And I thought, okay, that's fine. Except for in his head, he thought he's going to try to do two lanes at once. And of course, the problem was is that there I was in the right lane. So I kind of got hit right on the front. And luckily, uh, no long-term damage or anything like that. It was a, basically just a fender bender, a couple thousand dollars worth of, uh, of fixes is basically what it was. Uh, and in most normal circumstances, you just go through the protocol of what you do. You, you, know, you call the cops, you, know, you stay calm, you don't admit fault, all these sorts of things that they tell you to do. Uh, except for one little problem, and that was that the first words out of his mouth were, I don't have insurance. And he starts getting really worried about the fact that he's got kids and he's got a bunch of bills to pay and he's already in debt and ah, I don't have insurance, which kind of makes sense if, you, if you're in debt and you have a lot of bills to pay. You just can't afford insurance. And so it presented me with this question, and it's a question that we have to face when people do something to us that hurts. It's what are we going to do? What are you going to do in this situation? Left me in a really awkward position. Now, I know all the, right, the correct answer of what I should do. Just call the cops, and then we'll figure it out in court, and a judge will decide you know, how much money I'm going to get and all this kind of stuff. That's, that's the appropriate thing that you probably should do. But then, of course, there's the other side of the situation. And the other side of the situation is that this guy was just really genuinely sorry. Like, he really seemed like a good guy. Like, he was very sorry. He was kind of heartbroken. In fact, he he said something that we're going to hear in the parable that we read this morning. He, He said it almost verbatim. He said, just give me time, and I'll pay for it. He said, you know, I've got a friend who owns um, an, an auto care shop, and, and he'll fix up your car, and he'll do it really cheap, and I'll help pay for some of that. Just give me time. Please don't call the cops. I don't have insurance. Just give me time, and I'll pay for it. And so what would you do? What would you do in this situation? Because it's not just this, is it? Sometimes there's other big things that come up in our life as well. Sometimes it's that property line with the neighbor, that you never thought about, but now somebody wants to build something or somebody wants to do something on the land, and all of a sudden, this property line becomes a big deal. Or it's somebody who owes you thousands of dollars. Uh, It could be a relative that you see at a reunion who says something just absolutely terrible about you or about your spouse. Uh, It could be an adult kid of yours who just keeps borrowing and borrowing and borrowing money, and it doesn't really seem like they're ever going to pay you back. Uh, It could be something inappropriate that was said to you that you just can't get over. Uh, What do we do with these big things where we hold the keys 
of forgiveness, where we have a choice now, all of a sudden, what am I going to do in this really difficult situation? And maybe for some of us, we haven't experienced those really big situations, but we, what we do experience, I would say, is even bigger. It's the small little daily grievances that happen in our life with the people closest to us that we never really deal with. We just let them fester. And they, they create this resentment in our heart where we become, start becoming this resentful person. Like it's the spouse who, no matter how many times you tell them, will not consistently clean the litter box. I'm pointing right at myself for that one. Or it's the brother or sister who just keeps on getting underneath your skin. It's like every day things were going fine until my sibling came and just ruined everything. Or it's that same argument that you've been having with a coworker every single day. It just doesn't seem to go anywhere. Or it's being cut in front of on the freeway and all of a sudden words are coming out of your mouth that you forgot that you knew. Yeah, that happens sometimes. It's that incessant, just just children kind of messing up my to-do list for the day. I had all of my plans, and now they've just gone everywhere. Or it's that snoring spouse that's right next to you, and you're just thinking, oh my gosh, they're driving me absolutely nuts. Or it's that friend who's just nagging and nagging and nagging, and it's just become like white noise in your life. None of you can relate to any of that, correct? Correct. Good. All right, let the online crowd know that they laughed a little bit to that one. Um, I, would, I would say it's actually these little small things. It's these everyday small things that build up that can be even worse than the guy hitting you on the freeway, right? It can actually really, really impact your life. You're going to have to grapple with, okay, how do I actually forgive for these kinds of things? Um, that's the real work that Jesus is talking about this morning Have you ever wondered why life is this way? Is that really the way life is supposed to be? You can open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Uh, We're going to be in verses 21 to 35. Uh, Jesus is responding to a question that Peter has for him. And Jesus is going to tell a parable, a story. Now, if you've been around the past couple of weeks, you've heard from Pastor Brian, who's talked a little bit about what a parable is and that Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven here in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Jesus is telling a parable, which is a story to illustrate deep realities about what God's realm is like. So I'll put it this way. It, Jesus is not like inventing neat ideas about how he wishes the world was. He's actually just describing what reality actually is like. He's informing us what the world is actually like. The kingdom of heaven is how true reality actually operates. And then he gives his followers the option to see it, to hear it, and to live it out. So let's read in Matthew chapter 18. Verse 21, Peter says, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him, and since he was not able to pay it, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him, and he said, be patient with me, and I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him. He canceled the debt, and he let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And he grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay it back. But he refused and instead he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, They were outraged, and they went and they told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all of that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy 
on you. And in his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So the first thing we have to recognize when we read this story, and that's what it is, it's a story about this deep reality, is that Jesus is actually responding to something that just happened. In fact, if you go back to verse 15, you can see these couple of verses that come in. That's essentially a question about how do I deal with somebody else in the church, and that's the key here, somebody else in the community of believers, of followers of Jesus, when they've hurt me. How do I deal with that? And Jesus spells out a really clear process for how to do it. It's actually, it's a great process to use in general. It's something to keep in mind. He, he basically lays out, he says, first you talk to them one-on-one, and if that doesn't work, you bring two or three other people with you, and if that doesn't work, you bring them in front of the church, which we really don't do very often uh, in the modern church at all, but that's, that's what Jesus says. And then he says, if you don't listen, you can treat them like you would an outsider. And so it's just this really helpful process. But now Peter has a question about it. He, he has a question like, how many times, though, should we have to do that? How, how many times do we have to deal with that? And so in verse 22, it says, Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Now, in Jesus' day, the teachers of the law actually had a number for how many times you're supposed to forgive somebody who's in your church family. And they would have said, you forgive them three times. You forgive somebody three times, and then on the fourth time, there's no more forgiveness. That, that was kind of the common rule of law in that day. And so Peter, being kind of bold and using that Hebrew number for completion, which is the number seven, right? He, he brought up seven. He said, should I forgive somebody seven times? And Jesus does something. He uses an idiom that would have been common in his day. He says, not seven times, but 77. It's, it's another way of saying a never-ending amount of times, uh, a number of times to where you start losing track of just how many times you forgave that person in the first place. But let me just state something up front, even before we get into it. The whole idea of forgiving somebody three times or forgiving somebody seven times actually makes some sense, doesn't it? Because when somebody keeps doing the same thing and it's hurting you over and over again, we, we actually are wise to have some distance between that person, right? We, even as we talk about forgiveness this morning and look at this parable, we just have to recognize the fact that there's also wisdom here to say we don't allow what's actually called abuse to happen in our lives, right? There's, there's times where it's appropriate to actually distance ourselves from the person if it comes to that. And so Jesus isn't refuting that. He's not refuting that at all. But, but he's taking us into a different area. And I want, I want us to think about it, because it's not just them. It's us too. What happens when we do a behavior again and again and again, and it hurts somebody that we're closest to? Well, it shows us that there's some sort of an ongoing issue in our life, right? There's something happening in our heart that's not right. Like, this is not just some one-off event that can be easily rever- reversed. Like, getting hit on the freeway by someone is a one-off event that we can, we can fix, the bigger problem is my heart issues that, that seem to keep on popping up. It's that continual problematic issue that keeps coming. So this is actually a normal person of faith, a normal person of faith who is in a spiritual and a physical struggle with themselves. They're, they're, they're in a struggle. Why are we like this? Has anyone figured it out? Why do we seem to hurt the people that we love the most? Why does this stuff come out with the people that we love? This parable tells us something. It tells us that Christians, we Christians, are not immediately healed of everything that's wrong with us as soon as we start following Jesus, right? Otherwise, there'd be no reason for Jesus to tell this parable. He's talking about Christians who struggle. We're not magically perfect people. We are people who have been transformed In some ways, very miraculously, some of us, by God, he's transformed whole areas of our life. But God has left areas of your life and of my life not completely transformed yet, and he's left it there as a gift to you. 
Let me say it again. He's left that area, that struggle, the thing where you're like, I wish I was better at that. I wish I didn't struggle with that. As a gift for you, as a test, so that he can test your faithfulness, so that you can continue to choose to love and to follow him again and again. And so Jesus tells this parable first to highlight God's heart towards us. How does God feel about us? Well, what, how does God act towards us? How does he act towards people who struggle with sin but genuinely want to change? Let's look at verses 23 and 24. It says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. I love that, that the master here, uh, the God character here in the story, he wants to settle accounts with his servants. He wants things to be right. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, I love that translation because the, the kind of classic translation of this is to say 10,000 talents. And I remember as a kid reading that and thinking, I don't think that's the normal use of talents. I don't know what a talent is. But the, but the imagery of 10,000 bags of gold, just, just imagine that, like a big, I imagine like a big bag of gold. That's a lot of gold. Now multiply that times 10,000. So what in the world was this guy doing getting into that kind of debt? So just to give you some sort of like a reference point, the area in which they lived in Judea of the time, the annual income or the amount that they essentially made in one year for Judea was 600 of those bags of gold. So this guy had a debt that was like way, way beyond even like the whole state or province that he lived in. Just this incredible debt. Um, a, a lot of people have tried to figure out like, okay, how much money is this actually? Uh, one economist uh, that I was reading did a bunch of math back in 2010 and basically showed that this equates to about $7 billion in debt. That's the kind of debt. And, and Jesus is really saying it as a way to say a never-ending amount of debt. It's not, don't, you know, seven billion is a big number. It's even more than that. It, it's like a never-ending amount of debt. On the flip side, the guy who owed him money owed him a hundred of these denarii. Now, a denarii would have been a coin that you get for working one day's labor. So he, ha he owed him about a hundred of those coins. And, and that's a, not an insignificant amount of money, but it's like four months' labor. So, so what we have here is we have a $7 billion debt versus like a $12,000 debt. And, and the real point is that this guy, he had this debt that was insurmountable. Um, and so we should be asking ourselves, like what or who could possibly pay this debt? Who could do that? Uh, let's keep reading in verse 25. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Now we're not going to get into, let's not get into like ancient slavery and that kind of stuff. The fact that they're being sold into slavery here is just a part of their culture. But in that day, a slave, the maximum they would sell a slave for would have been one of those bags of gold. So the master's having his family be sold and all of his possessions be sold. And guess what? It's like not even a drop in the bucket. It's just like barely doing anything to the debt. And, and it merely shows something that, that the debt is going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you all the people in your life. It's going to cost you all of your possessions. And it's at this point that I think we, we ought to start inserting ourselves into this parable. Start thinking about yourself as the person in this parable. Not because God is like obsessing over all the wrong things that we do and keeping track of it all, uh, but because we owe everything to God. What do we owe to God? Every moment of our life is completely dependent on it. I mean, think about your breath. He gave me another one. He gave me another one. We, we tend not to think of it. We tend to go through life without thinking of these things. But I woke up again today. I didn't have to wake up. But God continues to sustain me. In fact, if I were to pay back God for everything that he continually gives to me in sustaining me, how could I do it? How could you do it? If somebody could keep track of it, how could you do it? 
And now sin is going to present itself on the other side of the equation. Sin is always at its core a self-delusion where we will believe that we owe God nothing. Let me say it again. The reality is that we, we owe God every single thing that we have. Every breath, everything that we experience, all the good things come from God. And sin is a self-delusion where it gets you to believe that I owe God nothing. I owe God nothing. And the story that Jesus tells is there to remind us of this reality, that God has done everything and that our response to this grace should always be humility. Uh, my sister and brother-in-law, who are just wonderful people, they're awesome. Uh, we moved in with them briefly about a decade ago when we were coming back into the area, and I was uh, getting a job at a different church, and we were just kind of getting our feet under us. And so we lived with them for about six weeks, and so they, we got onto their um, phone plan. We are, were still on a family phone plan with my sister and them, and they started paying for it, and I was like, hey, we can pay for that. And, and they kind of looked at us, and I think probably in their thinking, they're like, yeah, you guys don't make much money. Don't worry about it. We'll pay for your phone. No big deal. Well, it's been a decade or more. I think it's been about 15 years, and about once a year, and I just brought it up again a few weeks ago, I was like, you know, this is not like a lifelong plan. Like, I, I'm not wanting to take advantage of your grace and your goodness, like, forever. You can, we can start paying for the phone bill. And my sister, even a couple weeks ago, just looked at me and she said, honestly, I don't really care. It's all good. Just, she's like, just, you know, bake me a cake once a year or something like that. You know, it's like, but once you have this reference point, once you recognize who has been supplying everything this whole time, it kind of changes the way that you see them, doesn't it? Like it, once you recognize who's been paying the bill without you even thinking about it, and sometimes I'll go months without even thinking about it. I'm like, ah, I use my phone for free. Like, w what a blessing that that is. But once you kind of recognize that that's what's been happening this whole time, it changes the way that you think about life. And living a life where we take this for granted, Jesus is saying it's going to cost us something. If you take it for granted, it's going to cost you. Jesus would say that it's going to cost you everything and no amount of time or effort will save us. But honestly, sometimes we think we can save ourselves. And this is what starts happening. Let's continue to read in verse 26 and 27. It says that this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Now just think of how ridiculous this is. You have a $7 billion debt and you come before this person, you say, just give me time. That's all I need is a little bit of time. I, I know I'm making like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year, but if you just give me a little bit of time, I'll pay it back. And, and at this, look, at, it makes total sense. The servant's master took pity on him and he canceled the debt in an instant and let it, go. I just want you to like pause for a second and think about that, that God would just in an instant forgive that kind of a debt. Because he sees this begging that this guy does, and he sees that it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. In fact, when we think about our own state in front of God, we often adopt this kind of mentality where we just say, God, just give me enough time and I'll fix my problems. The way that I tend to do this is I tend to buy a book for every problem that I have. Do any of you do this? Uh, any of you book people out there where your office is just filled with books, right? If you go into my office here at the church, it's just filled with books, and that's because I've got a lot of problems. And every time, and I'm obviously just partially joking about that, but it's like something comes up, and it's like, I'll go find who's like the best-selling author on that thing. I'll become an expert on that thing. And if I know enough information, eventually it's going to change me and I'll be fixed and, and then we're all good. And then God, you don't have to do anything because I'm, I'm taking care of it. And, and just think about that mentality. Like processing information, gathering information, it's not a bad thing. But God looks at it and he just sees like, you have no idea how much debt you're in, do you? You think you can just fix it on your own? You think you can just read another story? 
This parable is telling us that we could have all the time in the world, we could have all the knowledge in the world, but our repeated issues that keep coming up again and again and again in our life, they're not going to be fixed in that way. Our indebtedness towards God can't be fixed by some sort of like more effort or by reading some new research about whatever problem it is. Because what's behind that sort of a mentality, the fix myself mentality, is actually just pride. It's actually just pride. It's just I'm going to pull up my bootstraps. I'm going to solve the problem on my own. And so the master here sees through the ridiculousness of this guy's heart. He sees through it and he takes pity on him. When we think we can solve our problems, we need the actual master. We don't need another quick fix solution. We need the master himself. What kind of a person would forgive us in an instant? Only God. And that's who we actually need. That's what we need. That's the God that we come here this morning to worship. That is the nature of the master's heart. He looks at us, he sees our indebtedness, and in an instant he reaches out in love and forgives us of everything. And so the question at this point of the parable that we should ask ourselves is do you allow the nature of the master to transform your nature? Do you allow the nature of the master to transform your nature? Does it turn me from a person who's trying to self-fix everything into a person who allows God to forgive me, to allow God to forgive me and to work on me? Because what the story tells us is what is normal. Because the normal thing is to receive something, to receive forgiveness, and then forget. To receive forgiveness and then forget. To receive forgiveness and then to forget. And and that's exactly what this guy does. In verses 28 to 31, it says, When that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, and he grabbed him and began to choke him. I mean, just think about that imagery. How could you be forgiven of everything and then immediately walk out and forget and grab this person and begin to choke them? And he says, pay me back. And his fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him. He says the same exact thing. He says, be patient with me and I'll pay it back. But he refused and instead he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay off the whole debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. You see, this man loved experiencing the grace and forgiveness of God, but he, he wanted nothing to do with God himself. Have you ever been in a friendship or a relationship where that's been the case? Where it's like, you didn't notice it at first, but after a while, you start recognizing like, oh, they're not actually in this friendship or this relationship because they love me or because we're friends. But they just like what they can get out of it. This is exactly what's happening. He, he's saying, God has forgiven us everything. And God forgives us everything because he trusts for us to do better. He trusts that we're going to do better. You don't forgive a person who you think has no chance of changing. The forgiveness of God is predicated on the understanding that his love will transform us. That love transforms better than coercion. God could have changed this guy's nature and forced him to change. But God in his loving forgiveness loves him and then allows him to respond in part. And so don't be surprised Don't be surprised next time you're forgiven for something big if God presents before you a test of forgiveness. If he puts before you a test to see what has happened to your heart. It's like you've been forgiven this great deal. All right, here comes a test. Let's see what happens to your heart. Um, The parable goes on in verses 32 to 34. It says, The master called the servant in and said, You wicked servant, I canceled all that debt because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back everything that he's owed. What is Jesus talking about? Again, he's describing reality. Why does he bring up jailers and torturers? Um, Remember, this is a parable. Again, it's not talking about specific jailers or torturers. It's talking about how reality 
works. He's telling us that when you can't show others the same grace that you've been showed to you, you actually subject yourself to a tortured life. You subject yourself to a tortured life, and not any kind of torture. Actually, the Greek word behind torturer in this text, uh, the connotation behind the word is of a person who elicits the truth. Let me say it again. Somebody who elicits the truth. In other words, the torturer is drawing the truth out and bringing it before you. So instead of the truth setting you free, when you hold on to unforgiveness, the truth actually torments you. That's what Jesus is talking about. When we fail to forgive others after having been forgiven by God, you're tormented by the truth. So instead of living the kingdom life, we live a life where the truth is continually tormenting us. The truth is continually per persisting within us. It's a never-ending reminder of what actually happened. In other words, this guy could never have enjoyed the $12,000. That's the best way to put it. Because the truth of the situation would not have allowed him to do it. So all this talk about forgiveness. Jesus wants us to forgive because we've been forgiven everything. And you probably are thinking something right now. You're thinking it's a really nice idea, but you don't know what that person did. You, you don't know. You weren't there. You didn't experience the thing that happened. And that reminds me of someone who, who probably some of you have heard about. Her name was Corey Ten Boom. And some of you are going to be nodding. Corey was... Uh, alive in the first half of the 20th century. She was a, a Dutch woman who lived through the Holocaust. Um, she eventually was caught because she had been harboring Jews in her house and saving their lives. And she was put into a concentration camp. Uh, she faced a lot of horrors. Her, her sister was killed in the concentration camp. And a few years after the war, Corey, amazing woman, Corey, she went to Germany and started preaching the message that God forgives. Imagine preaching that message in Germany right after the war, that God forgives in the place where they needed to hear it most. And after one particular talk, a man approached her who she recognized immediately. It was actually one of her jailers. It was one of the people who had kept her in, in the camp. It was one of the men who was responsible for her sister's death. And she describes the emotions that she was feeling as he was walking up to her after hearing her preach that God forgives you. And, and he described to her this story that after the war, he had become a follower of Jesus. And he was completely convinced in his heart that God had forgiven him of all of the horrible things he had done. But he came up to Corey and said, but I don't know if you forgive me. Do you forgive me? And this is, this is what she grappled with. She said her, her mind and her heart went immediately to Matthew chapter 18. She says, her mind went to, if you do not forgive others, neither will my father forgive you. She goes on to say that she knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality, and those who were able to forgive their former enemies were also able to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. But those who nursed their bitter bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. Forgiveness is a big deal. It's a big deal. You see, we tend to think of it as needing all kinds of conditions before we do it. But the real truth of what Jesus says is that when you harbor unforgiveness, you actually imprison yourself. You imprison yourself. Which is why Jesus didn't just tell a story about forgiveness. This is why Jesus went to the cross in the first place. This is why he went to the cross. Jesus gave us his life on the cross. The man who did nothing wrong, who had nothing to be forgiven of. He, he had never thought an impure thought. He had never done something wrong. He lived his life in the open. He lived it transparently in front of people. He had nothing to confess to people. And yet he died so that we would not be held in a prison that was locked from the inside by ourselves in unforgiveness. He forgave us everything. And he did it so that we can release other people from their prisons 
as well. Because here's the big idea this morning. Pride will make you a prisoner, but forgiveness sets you free. Pride will make you a prisoner, but forgiveness will set you free. And so maybe this morning you're hearing this and you're finally, something's finally clicking because you're thinking, I, uh, yeah, you know what? I said I forgave that person, but I actually am still struggling. I'm still carrying it around. And if that's you this morning, then I simply bring you back to the foot of the cross again. It's another reminder this morning that the one who knew no sin became sin for you so that you could have life. And he offers us his forgiveness at no cost. So here's my question for you. What is my pride costing me? What is your pride costing you? The fact that we hold on when God has released, what is that costing you? I was reading a psychological article this week that actually talks about the effects of what unforgiveness does to your body. And here they are. It gives increased risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer, compulsive behaviors, addictions. It destroys trust. It destroys intimacy. It creates passive-aggressive households. It actually went as far as to say that it is the number one family killer by harboring resentment and unforgiveness. But the most interesting thing, that the word that the article used to describe living a life of unforgiveness is that it called it a chain. It called it a chain that requires tremendous effort to carry. So I'm leaving you with this question today. Who in my life needs to be set free? Maybe it's yourself, maybe it's a friend, a spouse, or somebody you haven't seen in years. But that's the question for us this morning. Who in my life needs to be set free? If you've experienced uh, the power of forgiveness, you know exactly what this is all about. And we actually this morning have an opportunity to share that with each other. If you've been around the past couple weeks, you've seen these cards. Uh, There's probably a card in front of you or on the pew next to you. Um, This is an opportunity for those of us who have experienced forgiveness in a really profound way to be able to just simply share it with each other. Because here's the deal. We all come from different angles and we're at different points when it comes to forgiveness. We just are. And some of us are in a real struggle this morning. And if that's you, we have people here this morning to pray with you. There's people around you that would love to listen, to hear your story. There's also an opportunity for you to listen to the heart of God as well. But for those of you who have experienced something, we would love if you just wrote real simply in one sentence, um, how has forgiveness transformed your life? And then when you go out uh, afterwards, after the service, you can go into the lobby. There's twine that's hanging around the lobby and you can just find a clip and just clip it up. Because when we read what God has done for you, it might be exactly what somebody else needed to hear that sets them free. Would you pray with me? Lord, we, um, we thank you for the cross. It's one thing to talk about forgiveness. It's one thing to tell a story about forgiveness. It's a completely other thing to have you who needed no forgiveness to come and die for us so that we could be set free. Lord, you tell us that in your presence, there's freedom, that there's no more pain. And so for us this morning, Lord, we just, we admit, we want to be released from the things in our life that we have a very hard time releasing. My prayer for us this morning, Lord, is that your spirit would come and fill us right now. I pray that you would help do a supernatural work in us, release us so that we can release other people as well, Lord. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. We pray.